believe it's just me make, cut, making it up. I got it. We used to have this this kennel for Sierra's dog that was too small for the dog. We got her a bigger kennel, so we're not like she's free now. Okay? But I was thinking about how she was so big for that kennel and she couldn't move around, and I just imagined myself in the kennel. Something had me caught in the kennel. My sorrow and my pain. See, I'm talking about back in the day when I had first given my heart to the Lord. And I was trying to hold on to old mindsets. Right, right, that's good. Like I didn't, I'm just going to be honest with you, I didn't think Christianity was cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the way you people dressed. Right, right. I didn't like the music that you listened to. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I thought I could teach you something. Right, right, right. Because you hadn't been out there. And you hadn't seen what I saw. I, didn't, I was tired and sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right, man, right. But I wasn't ready to let go of my mindsets. Yeah. And I was thinking about that song. And how it was saying, oh, will you trade your sorrow and your pain for the joy of the Lord? Yeah. And it's like I was like that poor dog up in that kennel, all scrunched up bound and, up. and bound up, couldn't yeah. move. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to trade in my sorrow. I don't want to trade in my pain. I'm just going to sit right here. I'm going to get a little That's feed good. every now and then of this thing that I just feel like I got to have, this thing that I know that I have to have. Yeah. And I got to tell you something. Yes. The day that I finally started to whisper to the Lord that I don't want to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen overnight. Right. I got to tell you that it didn't happen overnight. But I had to come to the place where I was like, Lord, I want you to free me. Oh, yes. Lord, I want you to do a yes. work on the yes. inside of my heart. When I began yes. to say that in a minute, yes. God began to move and he began to operate. And I look backwards on where I used to be compared to where I am now. Wow. And the understanding yes. that he's given me. Yeah, but you're the preacher. Yeah, but I wasn't always a preacher. Right. And guess what? You don't have to just be a preacher in order to gain the wisdom of God and have understanding of God's ways. And as I've grown in my understanding of God's ways and his wisdom, I'm telling you, he's begun to set me free. I've learned to be content with what I have. And I've learned that whenever I become content with what I have, he's willing to give me more. I'm over here striving and struggling to get more. And one of the things I've learned is if I just learn to be content with what he's given me and thankful for what he's already given me, now he's like, I can finally trust you with a little more. So here you go. Here's another dis dispensing of your inheritance that you can have on this side of glory. Amen. I don't know if that speaks to you, but it spoke to me. And I just got to tell you, like, I try the best I can sometimes to explain things that I know that I've been through and the way that I felt. And I didn't even really realize at that time in my life that I was even bound up. Right. And I was holding on to mindsets. I can't get that through clear That's enough. I was holding on to mindsets that were lies from Satan. Yes. Like contrary to the, if it's contrary to the word of God, yes. it's a lie of the devil. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. We need to get an amen up in here. Yeah. If, it, yeah. if it opposes God's word and it's in our life. Then it's a lie from the devil. It's sin. It's going to lock us up in that kennel. And it's going to give us cla kennel claustrophobia. Yeah. And we won't even know we have it. Lord, we need to be Amen. delivered. We yes, need to be Lord. set free. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 28. And we're going to read verses 10 through 16. You know, I had already started working on my message whenever... Naya preached for us Wednesday night. If you missed last Sunday, you really missed an awesome service. Amen. Yes. And then if you missed Wednesday, I'm going to tell you, man, it was, I was just, man, I was blown away with Naya's message. It really did administer to me. And so I just got to tell you, Naya, I'm not trying to, like, I will eat off the table of what you serve because it was good. But I had already started my message, all right, before you preached. And uh, praise God, but it just coincided right there. Amen. So let's read right here. Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the type top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon you lie, to you will I give it, and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee. And in thy seed 
shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places wherever you go and will bring you again into this land for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. I titled my message, a rock for a pillow. I'm going to ask the Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you, Lord, to show up in the midst of this message. I know that you put a word in my heart, Lord, to speak to your people. But we, what we need really is for you to show up, Holy Spirit. That's how I've been praying, Lord God, as I seek your face. I'm thankful, Lord, for all that you've taught me, Lord. It's a lot of information, Lord God. But one of the things that I'm starting to realize more and more, it doesn't really matter how much the preacher knows. It doesn't matter how much the preacher says. What we need is the Holy Spirit yes. in our service. Yes. We need you here, Lord, to be the key yes. that unlocks the door to revelation. Yes. Lord, unless the truth is told, the people never hear it. Therefore, they can never believe it. But even when the truth is told, what we really need is for you to unlock the door, to cause it to go from our head to our heart, to cause the spiritual cataracts to be removed. Like the Apostle Paul said to the church of Ephesus, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be here this morning, that you would enlighten our eyes, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, that you would prepare our heart. For the truth of your word. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You know so in this story Jacob. He, he's on the run. We learned a little bit about it Wednesday night. He deceived. That's what his name meant essentially. Supplanter or deceiver. The word supplant means to try to take the place of another. Naya brought out that in their birth he was a twin. Jacob was a twin. He had an older brother named Esau. When they came out of their mother's womb, what did he do? He snatched a hold of his heel, trying to hold him back. Because he was trying to take his place that God had promised for him. Because God knew in advance that Esau didn't want what God was offering. Right, right. i got to tell you that there's many times in this world that we're still living in that people just really don't want what God is offering. Come on. Sometimes there's been times in our own life, yes. seasons, yes. where we really didn't want what God was offering. Help us, Lord, to be in a season of our life where we want what you're offering. But Jacob was a deceiver at heart, just like all of us, born of Adam the first time, before God changed his name to Israel and broke his hip and caused him to walk with a limp. He was known as the deceiver, but he would ultimately be changed to one who will rule with God, a prince of God. God wants to make you and I princes and princesses of the Lord, amen, that we would walk with him and walk in tandem with him and cooperate with him as he gets his work done on this earth. He said it, in you and in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we know that what that means is, is that ultimately Jesus was given to the world and that through faith in Christ, all people from all tribes, tongues, and nations can be blessed <laughs> If they would just believe in the word of truth. Amen. Yes. As Jacob was walking according to the will of God. Listen to me, child of God. We're not all going to be preachers. But I'm going to tell you something. It's God's will for your life that you walk with God. And that you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And that you allow him to work through you. To bring that part of his kingdom to fruition. Well, What, what are you talking about, preacher? He wants to use you as a testimony. As you and I learn to yield our life. To the presence of God, you know, to the will of God, you know what happens? He changes us. He changes our testimony. He changes our character. He changes our name. He changes us from Jacob, deceiver, to Israel, prince of God, one who will rule with God. And listen, that, this is New Testament Christianity. Uh, the church is always saying, oh, we want the book of Acts. We want New Testament Christianity. Well, guess what? It's not just shaking and jerking. It's not just, Angie said something the other day, it's not about how high you can jump, but basically how straight you can walk. And how true is that? New Testament Christianity changes us on the inside and it makes us look different. And whenever that happens, guess what happens? It brings a testimony to the glory of God. It brings a testimony that God can do what he says he can do, that his word can do what it says it can do, that he can change a rascal like Matt Amen. He can sure enough change one like you. Yes. Amen. And then when we yield ourselves and cooperate with the Holy Spirit, come on. Yeah. Yes. We got to cooperate with him. We got to let him work in our lives. We got to yield ourselves. Yes. 
to the will of God. We got to say, no, Lord, I don't want to be like that big dog caught up in that little bitty kennel where I can't move and I'm stuck. And my mindset says, oh, Christianity isn't cool. Christian people don't dress cool. Uh, Christian music doesn't sound right. Oh, none of my friends are Christians. I don't, I don't want to hang out with Christians. I want to hang out with... No, we can't live that way anymore. Amen. We got to allow God to change our mindsets. Because there's nothing better on this earth than living for Jesus. And listen, when we begin to believe that, he's going to crack open that door and he's going to let us out. <laughs> and when we get out, we're going to realize we were in bondage. And we were buying the lies of Satan. And what we really need is to be set free. And once we start getting set free, we're going to be so grateful. And we're going to think to ourselves, how silly was I? Yes. I don't know if you'll ever say that, but I know I've said that. How silly was I? To try to hold on with a tight fist onto all those things that I thought were so good for me and were making me feel so good and were, and were giving me so much fun. And in reality, it was just keeping me locked up like a big dog in a small kennel and I couldn't get around and I couldn't move. Yes, yes. Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob had deceived his brother Esau. Jacob was on the run. He had no peace in his life. Fear was gripping his heart. Mm. But that night, something happened. Mm. See, the title of my message is A Rock for a Pillow. Because he lighted upon a certain place, there in that place, the sun was setting, he found himself some rocks, and he made himself a pillow. I got to tell you that the gospel is almost as illogical as a rocks for a pillow. It doesn't make any sense to the human mind. What I'm saying by illogical, when you talk to someone out there, and you try to talk to them about Jesus, in their mind, if their heart hasn't been open to the truth of the gospel, they're thinking in their mind, how in the world... A 33 and a half year old Jew dying on two pieces of wood outside a little city called Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is ever going to have an effect on my life. Well, just hold on a second, brother, because if you would be willing to open your heart up just a little bit and let some of that truth in there, you will be amazed at how God can move and change your life. Because God has been changing people's lives based on that truth for thousands of years. Hallelujah. And he'll continue to do it if we will let him. But sometimes people would rather be like a big old dog caught up in a little kennel and hold on to all those things. And I, I see that in Jacob's life right here. But listen, he, he got some rest that night. You know, when I think of a pillow, I think of rest. I, I think of rest, you know, and, and even though Jacob is going through all of these things, that night he got some rest. He rested so much, I think it would be safe to say he entered into REM sleep <laughs> because he dreamed. Now, granted, I know it was a spiritual dream. It was a God dream. But at the same time, you, got, you, you have to be in a certain sleep state for that to happen. Right. He dreamed a dream that affected the, the, all of uh, the God's people for all times. A re great revelation was given to Jacob that night. And I'm going to get into it in a little second. But when I think of a pillow, I think of rest. And I would imagine that you all have at some point in time been in your life like I have been at times, even as a believer, where my sleep evades me. I don't find the sleep that I desire. I lay my head on the pillow. Instead of going to sleep, I'm tossing and I'm turning. And sometimes it might be for physical reasons. Maybe I might have back pain or a leg pain. But many times it's not just a physical situation. Sometimes our sleep evades us because of spiritual turmoil mm -hmm. in our lives. Like Jacob, we're running in the wrong direction. Like Jacob, we're doing things according to our own will rather than the will of God. And the rest that we really crave isn't just a nighttime sleep, but the rest of our heart, the rest our heart's desire speaks to us all day long. Have you ever been there before? Where you're like carrying a heavy burden and the rest of God is speaking to you. And we know we don't have rest or peace because we can feel the weighted burden in our life. And things just aren't right. Many times they aren't right and we lack peace in those moments because we aren't allowing God to be the author of our plans. Let's just slow down for a second and think about that. To him who knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. That is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Lord, we need your help to first know what to do and second, the grace that we need to do what is right. But one of the things that we will find ourselves in whenever we're being the author of our own plans and making decisions for ourselves according to our own will and not God's is that there will be a burden of conviction in our life. And that burden of conviction in our life prevents us from being able to get the rest of God that our heart so desperately desires. 
life becomes tiresome. Our lives are zapped of strength and become weighted down. Have you ever been there before? Look at Psalm 32, 3 and 4. This is the psalmist David speaking. He says, when I kept silence, Psalms 32, 3 and 4. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Look at Psalm 38 and 4. Real quick, Psalm 38 and 4. He says, this is David again. He says, for my iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Look at John 16 and 8. This is the Lord Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit. He says, when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Another translation that I use sometimes says instead of reprove, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. David said that when he held on to his sin, when he was quiet about it and refused to acknowledge it before God. See, this is the beauty of true Christianity. You don't have to come to the preacher. You can if you want to. I'll pray with you. I'll give an open ear for you. But you don't have to come to the preacher. Jesus died so that you could go straight to the Father. Hallelujah. And David said, when I refused to acknowledge my sin before God, and instead I held on to it, I was shut mouth. <laughs> this morning when there was a little texting going on and something happened, and I think it was Robert sending an emoji that had a zipped lip. <laughs> zipped lip. Don't want to talk. When I zip my lip towards God, no, don't zip your lip towards God. Don't let the devil put a zipper on your lips. No, get along with the Lord. And listen to me, but I'm scared preaching that even though I say I want God to do something, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and do the wrong thing. God is aware that human beings sometimes say one thing and do the other. If you can pray from your heart that you want him to change... You, guess what? That can begin a process of change can start to take place in your life. As a matter of fact, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired many times, that's when he truly shows up and begins to do the work. David said when he held on to his sin and refused to acknowledge it before God, it was a heavy burden. His body felt like the end of a hot summer day where the sun had stolen his moisture and all his strength was gone and the hand of God was like a heavy burden on his heart and he could not shake the way he felt. And Jesus tells us in the John passage that the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin. And you know another word for convict is to convince the world of sin. Listen to me. You will be inundated with a message from the world. The message is screaming loud today. They're screaming in the universe. The world is screaming in the universities. I mean, I'm just going to be real with you. I got two daughters that have been in college for a while. And I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm not going to look at them, no, because I don't want them to look at me ugly. I'm going to look at y'all. But I'm telling you right now, in the universities, the world is speaking a message that is contrary to the word of God. And the world or the university is either right or God is right. But they ain't both right. Just like I talked to that Muslim lady the other day. And I'm like, there's only one God and so one of us is wrong. That's just the truth. The world's either right or God's right. God's word says that this is right. This is the one I'm going to choose to believe. But it's not just in the universities. It's everywhere that we go. There is a, there is a system. There is a spirit in the atmosphere that is trying to convince us that particular things are right and those particular particular things that they're saying are right are contrary to the word of God. And you, my friend, all of you and myself and my family included are going to have to make a choice on which one they're going to believe. Lord, help us to know your will. Help us to know your word and give us the grace that we need in order to walk according to your will. Because let me tell you something. If we want God's grace flowing in our life, we need to order our steps according to his will. God wants to bless us. God wants to prosper us. He wants to help us. But he also desires, no, indeed his word demands that we would trust him, that we would believe him, that we would learn his ways, that we would hear his voice, that we would take of his wisdom and knowledge and his intellect. No, 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 no. Science doesn't tell me how this world was created. God told me how this world was created. Science needs to catch up 
to the, to the truths of God, not the other way around. I'm convinced. Listen to me, you think that the devil, and this isn't even in my message, but you think the devil's not smart enough to figure out ways to confuse the, to confuse man? The book of Romans says in chapter one that the full, that God, that these people became foolish in their own minds because of their own wisdom. And they began to worship the created things rather than the creator himself. They get to the point so much where they're worshiping Mother Earth instead of worshiping the God that created the earth. Lord, help us. When we feel this burden and uneasiness in our spirit, we need to be trained that it's the spirit of God pleading with us. He's convincing us that we're doing something. And I don't know what it is that you're doing. I'm, I'm just saying like he convinces me that I'm doing something wrong. Something is wrong. I'm not doing it right. Right? I'm not doing it according to his will. That's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit is. He's convincing us. But we're doing something in a way that he wants us to stop it is the point that I'm trying. In our story of Jacob, he has all kind of promises on his life. He was chosen and highly favored by God. The very plan of God was going to go right through Jacob. It was going to move over his brother and go right through him. Even still, he was arrogant, deceptive, and did things his own way instead of God's way. And there's no peace at this point again because he's been deceptive and through it cheated and angered his older brother. Now he's running for his life and all the things to find comfort. He finds some rocks and he makes himself a pile and he uses it for a pillow. And despite the fact that it makes no sense, the rest of God showed up. The peace of God showed up and the word of God came and through this one night, great revelation comes to the children of God. Look at this. John chapter one, verse 51. You remember the dream that Jacob had? He's on the run. He finds a pile of rocks. He lays his head down for a pillow. He falls asleep. He dreams a dream. And this is what he dreams. He dreams that he sees a ladder going into heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending on the ladder. And this is what Jesus says 2,000 years later. He said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The ladder that Jacob saw represented access into the presence of God, and Jesus tells us that he is the fulfillment of that access. Whatever you're running from, whatever you're going through, whatever it is that's robbing your peace and keeps you awake at night, whatever has your mind twisted and tormented and causes the hand of God to be heavy upon you, I got good news. It does not have to remain that way. Hallelujah. Jesus made a way for us to access the presence of God. That's so important. He made a way for us to access the presence of God so our conviction can be replaced with comfort. That's right. You know, before some of y'all got here, I, 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 I said this story like there was a song that we sung. And I, I, I apologize for being repetitive to the rest of you. But there was a song that we sung that talked about I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my pain. I'm trading them in for the joy of the Lord. And as we were we were worshiping, I fought in my mind, though, that I had certain mindsets even after I was a Christian. Certain mindsets that the world had placed on the inside of me. And I didn't want to let them go. And I thought about the fact that we, we got this new dog in our house. And at one point in time, we had a little small kennel. And that dog, used to, it was too big for the kennel. And it was stuck. And I felt I feel like when I look backwards on the way my life was, I was kind of like the, 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 the dog in the kennel. I couldn't move. And I thought that I wanted to, to be there because I wanted my mindsets. I wanted to hold on to the way I understood things. But the whole time I was in bondage and I was just waiting to get like a little morsel. And then whenever the Lord is like the Lord opened it up. See, I'm trying to talk about an open heaven right now. I'm trying to talk about a ladder that extends into heaven, that extends into the presence of God. And it's almost like I can remember even still. She likes her new kennel because it's much bigger, but she still likes it a whole lot more when I open the door. Yeah. When I open up the door and let her out, she's really happy when I open the door and let her out. And I'm here to tell you that God opened up the door. Yeah. God opened up the door and he made a way for you and I to be able to access the presence of God. I can't even tell you the value in that. I can't even tell you how powerful that is that you and me 
can enter into the presence of God because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross and he paid the penalty of our sin. And if you and I will learn to believe that, not just one time, no, but every minute of every day, learning for that to become the new focal point of our faith. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I was born like Adam on that day, but on this day, I was born anew. And from this day moving forward, I'm going to keep on walking with the Lord. And the world might try to tell me this, and the old friend might try to tell me that, but the word of the Lord tells me to follow him each and every day and to trust that he made a way. He opened up a portal into heaven so that I can live with the Lord. I, the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 2 that I'm in Christ seated in heavenly places. Right now, child of God, you're in Christ. Right now, child of God, from the day that you got saved in the mind of God, you, your old man that was born in sin, was baptized into Christ. Your old man died with him. Your old man was buried with him. And a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Don't get tired of hearing that. Because listen to me, if, if, you, if you and I still find ourselves like that dog caught in the kennel, then it hadn't moved from here to here. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then when that moves from here to here, now i got to start applying it to every little detail of my That's life. That's right, amen. Every little detail, not just the lust, not just the drug, not just the alcohol, not just the fornication, but the bad attitude. The personality flaw. The cheating on the taxes. Oh, come on. Good. Show up next Wednesday because we're about to get into practical Christian living. Come on. The treating my brother and preferring him over myself. Yes, the, the, the learning of how to be selfless instead of selfish. Okay. Learning how to live and to allow Jesus to live through me yes. each and every day. See, that's the gospel. The gospel is that the old man dies and the new man lives. And the new man is a reflection of Jesus. That sounds real simple, doesn't it? Start living it. Start living it and realizing that it's not really that comfortable. Amen. And that yet, nevertheless, if we would just yield to the Lord, even though it's uncomfortable, even though he starts to deal with us in our old ways. Amen. And we, know we sometimes we come fighting. We come squirming. We don't like it. But God is, God is going to do the work if we allow him to. Amen. Amen. Jacob had a beautiful revelation that night that, that Jesus was going to come one day. He didn't know how the heavens were going to be open. Listen, 2,000 years before Jesus showed up, that's the beauty of God's word. Don't tell me I get too deep. No, 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 no. We need to hear the word of the Lord. We need to understand how, how true God's word is, how true he is to his plan. 2,000 years before Jesus was ever born, God gave Jacob a dream of the heavens opened and Jesus tells us, I'm here. I am the fulfillment of Jacob's dream. I am the fulfillment of your access to the presence. What do you need this morning? What do you need freedom from in your life? What kind of direction do you need? I'm here to tell you there's an open heaven for you. I'm here to tell you that there's an open heaven for you and that you can access the presence of God and that whatever it is that you're going through, I'm here to tell you that God can and wants to show up for you. Amen. 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 Satan's whole purpose, though, is to convince us that he has what we want. There's a spiritual warfare that is raging in our lives and the enemy of our soul wants us to believe that we want and have to have what he offers more than this rock pillow that promises rest. The way that God works doesn't make sense to the logical mind any more than a rock pillow, right? But Psalm 1611 says this, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Oh, so what are you saying, preacher, that if I'll just trust the Lord and learn his ways, that everything's going to go just, to, of course I'm not. I would be a lying preacher then. If I did not take the time to tell you that this earth has fallen and that even people that love God fail God and in turn fail you and I and that we're not going to have times of frustration. No, I would be a liar if I told you that. But what I am telling you is this, is that God will show you the path of life. If you want him to, he will show you the path of life and that in his presence is fullness of joy. And that you and I can learn to walk with him and to experience his presence. Amen. Amen. God's people need to understand that they're in a spiritual war and the rest of God isn't going to come to them through a counselor, 
a medicine, a relationship, a new job, a car, a house. None of that's going to provide the rest we need. God wants us to climb the ladder through faith in Jesus and his sacrifice so we can enter his presence Amen. and be Amen. changed. That is the will of God. And the less we quit fighting it and coming kicking and screaming and learn to yield to it and cooperate with the presence of God in it, I'm telling you, the whole lot better we're going to feel. He wants to put his presence in us so he can do his work through us. That is his will. That is his work. This is point number one. And really, there was a point in my introduction. Point number one really was, is that a rock for a pillow, right? But point number two, I guess you could say is this. Jesus is the living stone that spreads his life to others. I failed you this morning. Man, I had these rocks that Danielle has painted. It's like a little clump, clump of rocks that she's got on the table. And I, I, I was supposed to put it out so I could grab it. And there's this one that she painted a cross on with these little bitty dots. It's real pretty. Everybody else is coming to lunch that you'd be able to see the rocks. But I was going to grab the rock. And what I was going to do, it's about like that big. And it's got like a pretty cross painted on it. And she's got some other little rocks painted. And she just got them in a pile right there on the table. Just some kind of decoration. I was going to bring the rock, and I was going to take the rock, and I was going to drop it onto the floor to make a point about this rock, because I'm about to read a scripture to you about a living stone. And that this living stone turns you and I into lively stones. And I was going to take that rock, and I was going to hand it to the first person, and I was going to say, back, pass it back there and give it to Miss Angela, so that I make sure I get my little rock back, because I think that rock's pretty. And the point is, is though, is, is that that living rock is Jesus and that that living rock spreads through and brings life to living stones. That's right. Let's go ahead and read the scripture right here. First Peter chapter two, verses one through twelve. And this point right here is that Jesus is the living stone that spreads his life to others. Verse. Uh, actually, I guess I started at verse four in my notes here. To whom coming as unto a living stone. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the living stone. You're coming to him. Did you come to Jesus yet? Amen. I hope you did. That's what it's talking about. Did, did you come? You're coming to Jesus who's the living stone. Disallowed indeed of men. What that means is, is that there have been many that have rejected the living stone. But chosen of God and precious. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion. That's a name of a mountain in Jerusalem. He says, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. The enemy wants to convince you that if you put your faith in Jesus and he changes your life and you start talking about him, that you're going to be ashamed. And I'm here to tell you that the word of God says the opposite. That he that will believe on the living stone will not be confounded, which means to be ashamed. And instead, you will begin to see that Jesus is precious. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling. Can I, can I just kind of like, give me a second. Back in the day, I don't know anything about construction. I want to learn. I'm going to learn. I've learned some things, okay, but I don't know too much right now. All right? Nowadays, whenever you build a house, that's on a slab, you pour a slab, right? That's what, that's a foundation. Back in these times, they didn't do that, though. They had a cornerstone. They'd get these big old stones, and they'd square them out, they'd chisel them, till they, and that's where they would start. That's where they would, and that was the beginning of the foundation. So from that stone right there, they built the whole thing, and the whole foundation was started off of that cornerstone. What this scripture is saying is that he is the living stone that's been given from God that brings life to all you and I that have become lively stones and that this stone is the head of the corner but that it's also become a stone of stumbling to them that have been disobedient and have chosen not to believe. All those people that you know out there in the world that you've tried to talk to a little bit about the Lord but they don't want to have nothing to do 
with God, or even those that say they want to have something to do with God, but when you really start talking about it, then they don't want to really have anything to do with God. The stone of Jesus has become a stumbling block for them. They've tripped over it, and that they've fallen down because it offended them. Because the truth of the gospel has a way of offending us whenever we're in opposition to the word of God. We don't want to hear that we're in opposition. We don't want it to believe anything is our fault. We want to believe that it's something else. No, many times the problems in our life do have to do with our own fault. Not always. Other people's decisions affect us. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that whenever we reject the truth of Jesus, we bring a stumbling upon ourselves. He goes on to say in verse 9 this though, but you, see you're different. You're not going to stumble over that stone. You are different. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Has God called you out of darkness? Has he called you into the light? I don't know about you, but if you and I would begin to see Jesus as the precious living stone that he is, if we would begin to believe that he can give that life to us, amen, and that life begins to manifest itself in us, then we become the holy nation, the chosen of God. Look what he goes on to say this. Verse 11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers. I'm begging you. This is what he's saying. Peter's saying, I'm begging you. You're a holy nation. You're a royal priesthood. You're, you're a lively stone being built upon the cornerstone. You're part of the habitation of God. God wants to live his spirit in you. I'm begging you right here. You're a stranger. You're a pilgrim. You're a, in other words, you're on a journey. This place is not your home. And look what he says. I'm begging you, abstain from fleshly lust. You got to stay away from it. I'm, I'm begging you. This is the word of the Lord. Peter's saying it to you, he's saying it to me, the preacher. I'm begging you, stay away from fleshly lust. Why? Because they war against your soul. They war against, there's a war taking place. And when you and I engage in fleshly lust, it causes a war to take place on the inside of our soul. He goes on to say this, having your conversation or your behavior honest among the Gentiles are those that don't know God. What do you think it does? I'm just saying. What do you think it does when the child of God or somebody who wants to live for God goes and intermixes themselves with people in the world and lives like they do? What do you think happens? You bring glory to Jesus? Hmm. No. We don't bring glory to Jesus. We ain't helping nobody like that. You think we're going to go up in the mix of them and act like them and live our lives like them and that's going to bring glory? No, let me tell you how you bring glory to the Lord. You separate yourself. I'm not telling you don't ever answer their text message. I'm not telling you don't ever say hello to them. What I'm telling you is you separate your new life as a lively stone from that old life of sin. And you let them know, I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I know I can't sing, but come on. He's worthy. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to say yes to Jesus. No to sin. No to the world. Hallelujah. And I'm going to do better for them than if I get myself all mixed up in their mess. I beg you, brethren, abstain from fleshly lust because they war against your soul. God sent the living stone and he's turning you and I into lively stones. Hallelujah. He's building upon the cornerstone, a place where his presence can dwell, a place where his presence can show those out there that he changes us. Amen. You're a pilgrim. You're a stranger. This is not your home. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus is described as a living stone. He's come to give us life. Amen. Much of the world will reject him, but he is the foundation of God's plan. And when we allow him to impart his life to us, not only do we receive peace for living, but we start to exhibit 
his life in ours. You know, I always feel like it's very important that we teach some of these truths because look what we're talking about right now. Once again, don't forget about the dream. Don't forget about the ladder. Don't forget about the open heaven and the access to God. And let's, let's break that down a little bit more. Let's not just be so vague and abstract about it. Let's not just have a Monet painting that you can barely tell it's water lilies. Let's turn this into a very concrete picture. And let's talk about how this works. How does this fleshed out in your daily life? We're going to teach a little bit. Just work with me. Hold on a second. Don't fall asleep on me. Don't allow slumber to fall upon your eyes. Amen. Let's wake up. Hallelujah. Jesus is the access pointed to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Man is sinful. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is rooted in pride. Sin is contrary to the word of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Sin is contrary to the word of God. And it, it comes from Satan. It, 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 it stems in pride. And because sin is contrary to God's word, it separates from God's presence. But God, oh, but God sent the living stone that had no sin. And we know his name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. And Jesus died on the cross. It's very important that we get this. Let's slow it down a little bit. Man has sin. He's born of Adam. Man, because of his sin, is separated from God. But God sent Jesus. And what did he do? He died on the cross. Did he die for his sin? No. He didn't have sin. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. He had no sin. He died for our sin. And now somebody told us the good news about the stone of life. And we believed that word by faith. The life of Je Jesus was given to us. We all, by the Spirit of God, become lively stones. The life of God, the breath of God is imparted to us based on faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Listen to me. You're not getting up the ladder without it. Mm -hmm. Amen. You can't climb up that ladder without it. You know, I kind of spent a couple of weekends with a couple of guys that have these really cool ladders. One of the things I learned, if you don't spray a little WD-40 on this cool ladder, you know, it's like, like it extends. It's only that big, and before you know it, it's like way up in the sky. But then you're over here trying to click it to get it down, and it's getting stuck. you got to spray some WD-40, or, or you figure out a way not to let it stay in the rain, one or the other. But the point is that it gets stuck. I'm here to tell you that Jesus will give you access. His ladder don't ever get stuck. He opened up a portal for us to be able to get into heaven, amen, and we can access his presence. And I'm here to tell you, that's why the message of the cross is so crucial. Yes. No, people don't get it. Man, I don't get it. This preacher and Brother Swagger, and they over there, and they keep preaching. Yes, well, what about the resurrection? Dad, let me tell you something about the resurrection. The resurrection is the fruit of the cross. The resurrection is the proof that it worked. The resurrection is what you're supposed to be living in today. But if you don't learn how to stay dead in Christ, you ain't never going to learn how to live in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. No, it's a learning how to put your faith in the right object. Amen. Believing that what Jesus did was enough. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm saying that every preacher that you've been sitting under that wasn't telling you the truth was telling you a lie. And that, oh, you believed God, you believed in Jesus and the cross so that you could get saved, but now you need to start believing in all this other stuff so that you can walk right with God. What are you talking about? Oh, I need to access grace because I need power for a living. So what I need to do is I need to get up at 3 o'clock every morning and I need to worship the Lord because that's what the preacher told me. Can I tell you something? Hold on a second. Hold on to that thought. I got to get up every morning and I got to do this ritual. I got to read this much of the Bible. I got to spend this much time in prayer. I got to go to church this many times. I got to get involved in ministry. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, no, no. Jesus did it. Amen. The only reason you can walk up that ladder is because he clothed you with his righteousness and the heavens have been opened for you and you can enter in. Now when you understand that, oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. The devil don't want you to understand that. Right, right. The, the, the devil doesn't want you to understand that because if you don't understand that, you don't know where to put your faith. And so you're just walking around here like the dog in the kennel. You're stuck. You can't move. You can't do it. You're burdened down. You're like David. You're in the middle of a hot summer day. Your moisture is being stolen from you. Your strength is being stolen from you. But Lord, I want to do what's right. And I can't find the strength that I need to. Hold on. Jesus died. And there was an exchange that took place. And he gave you his righteousness. And he took your sin. And I'm here to tell you that's what the word of the Lord says. 
But everybody else out there preaching this message that says, oh, you got some stuff you got to do. No, brothers and sisters. Yes, you do. You got to believe. You got to believe in the word of the Lord. You got to believe in the plan of God. And whatever it was that was ailing you, I don't care what it is. Oh, they didn't have crack cocaine back in Paul's day. I would, Jesus ain't worried about no crack. That's it. Jesus will destroy the power of crack. The demons of crack have to bow at the name of Jesus. I don't care what kind of sin it is. It's got to bow at the name of Jesus. But you and I got to know where to put our faith first. That's right. Amen. And when we put our faith there, and then we begin to cry upon the name of the Lord. Then you even just whisper the name of the Lord. It's like the heavens are open and yeah. climbing up that ladder. And I'm in the presence of the Lord because Jesus has already made the way. I can't say it enough times. Jesus has already made the way. Faith in Christ and Him crucified has made the way. It's a finished work. It's a completed work. And me learning how to trust in that each and every day. Each and every day, child of God. Not just so I can throw the crack pipe away. If you happen to be a crack addict. And I know nobody in here is, but maybe you watch a video. Yeah, it, it, not just so you can throw the crack pipe away. No. So that you can speak to your spouse with love. Lord, Amen. help me. Come on, huh? Come on, now we're preaching for real. Then I don't have to lose it whenever they press my button. Right, right. Don't, Lord, uh, Isabel was like, say, okay, Daddy, why don't you get it? I'm going to get it, sister. <laughs> I'm going to get it. The Lord's going to do it in my life. Glory. I'm going to learn how to talk right. How to act right. By the grace of God, I believe God can do that for me. He can change me. He can make me look more like Jesus and less like the old man. What is it that ails us? What is it that's messing us up? Walking around frustrated and in strife and chaos and living the Jerry Springer show. Day after day after day. Lord, help us. I don't want to live like the Jerry Springer show. I want to live like, I want to be in the grace of the Lord. I, I want to feel the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Hallelujah. Gentleness, meekness, kindness, long-suffering. Lord, make me look more like you. Amen? That's what happens. That's what I'm trying to teach you. But I need the Holy Spirit, Lord. I need you to be the key to unlock the door. Because you know what? Sometimes our flesh just likes that. Sometimes our flesh will like Giving somebody a tongue lash is better than we like. Not, I mean, I never smoked crack, but better than people like smoking crack. That feels so good when I give somebody a what for right there, boy. Mm -hmm. I'm about to tell you about yourself. Right. I'm about to, about to get all up in my flesh. It makes me feel good when I tell you about yourself. No, that's not of the Lord. That's flesh, and we need deliverance from that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We need deliverance from anger problems and all of those things. Lord, help us. This is just real living right here. Jesus, we need you to change us. And I'm here to tell you that what he did opened up the door into heaven so that you and I could access the presence of God. If we get up there, it looks a whole lot different up there, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Ain't all that bickering and murmuring and complaining going on up there. There's peace and joy and the angels are singing and they're talking about how beautiful Jesus is, how precious he is. Amen. The streets are paved in gold. Amen. And they're going to bow down and worship him because he's worthy. Lord, help us. So now God is building a house of lively stones. It's called the body of Christ, the house of God, the church. But the church is in a building. Amen. It's you and me. And his life in us offers life to the world. But just as then is the same today, they rejected him then and some will reject him today. But if you choose to accept the real Jesus and you choose to live for him, others may mock you. But there's a reward That's in right. heaven That's right. that awaits you. Amen? Amen. That was point number one, I guess, was rocks for a pillow. Jesus is the Jesus is the rock that's a pillow. You can lay your head upon that pillow and you will receive rest. I know it doesn't make sense, but I'm here to tell you, sometimes the gospel doesn't make sense. But if we will believe it, it will work in our lives. Amen? Amen. Point number two was the fact that he was the rock of rest. Amen? But this, this, here we go. Point number, point, I'm sorry, point number two was that Jesus is the living stone that spreads his life. Point number three, he's a rock of war. You ready for this? Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 19. See, I just 
in about 15 minutes told you the whole purpose. Do you realize that, that that is such a huge purpose of the whole gospel? Think about this, man. Just bear with me for a second. Adam and Eve find themselves in a fallen state in the garden, separated from the presence of God, try with the works of their own hands to cover their own nakedness. God says that's not going to work. He kills an animal and he clothes them with the skins of an animal. Basically showing us thousands of years in advance that the way that you and I would be able to enter back into the presence of God is through the slaying of the innocent one to die in place of the guilty one. Right? As time moves forward, God calls Abraham out, there was no nation called Israel, to create a nation called Israel that through him, Jesus would come. And Jesus came to die on the cross to fulfill that, that, that animal that was sacrificed in the garden, to fulfill all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, to, to prove to us that God was going to make a way so that we could enter back into the presence of God. But let me tell you something, the devil's been fighting it the whole way. The devil is fighting the overall plan of God, trying to make the word of God fail. And guess what? He's also, and you know how he does it most? In your life and in my life. Yeah. He's trying to cause the word of God to fail in your life. He's trying to cause the word of God to fail in my life. He wants you and I to become frustrated and to feel like, you know what he'll do? He'll whisper in your ear just like he whispered to you. Did he not? He whispered to you. But that was some good stuff that I was talking about. <laughs> You know one of the things she said that was so good? She was like, Eve didn't even freak out whenever she starts, whenever that snake starts talking to her. She said, I would have freaked out. It's almost like they've been having conversations before. It's like the voice of temptation. It's not the first conversation. Keeps on talking. Keeps on talking. Keeps on whispering. Till finally get you to believe a lie. And it was a lie the whole time. That's what the forces of darkness want to do in our lives. The forces of evil want to destroy the word of God in our life. And that's how he plans to destroy the word of God on this earth. But Jesus is a rock of war. You ready? Look at this. Matthew 16, 16 through 19. Simon Peter answered and says, you are the Christ. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Yeah. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the one that the father promised way back starting in the garden. You are him. And I can see it. He says, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus answered this and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto you, you are Peter. That means small rock. And upon this rock, large rock, the truth you just said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus said the enemy and the forces of evil are going to try to build their kingdom and try to advance on my church. But based upon the truth that you said that, yes, indeed, I am the one that was promised from ages Hallelujah. past. I have come to do what the Father has sent me to do. Based upon that truth, the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, there's a good illustration in the Bible. And I love the story. It's my favorite story. See, this idea of the forces of evil trying to combat the kingdom of God is just like Goliath. Similar to Goliath standing afar and echoing threats to Israel across the valley of Elah through tactics of fear. The kingdom of darkness causes God's people to cower and to become paralyzed so they can't turn their focus towards their only hope, which is Jesus and the victory that he won for us at Calvary. God placed a stone in the sling of that boy. And young David propelled it into the forehead of that lying giant. What kind of giant do you face today that has been lying to you and telling you that you're not going to make it, that you can't be free? What giant is it that lies to you and tells you that it can never be different in your life and that you will always be stuck in the rut where you are today? For 40 days, they had been tormented and ridiculed by this giant. They had been paralyzed and stricken with fear. How long have, how, you know how long people sometimes live in bondage? Paralyzed and stricken with fear. 
They couldn't move for God. They couldn't fight for God. All they could do was act like they were serving God. They were acting like they were going to battle, but they really weren't. Every day it was the same thing. The enemy, the giant in their life was ridiculing them. But then a suddenly happened. Young David showed up into the camp. He hopped into the valley. He picked up five stones. He loaded one in his sling. And in a matter of moments, everything was different. Uh, that's right. In a matter of moments, everything was different. The chatter stopped. The rock killed the giant. The giant fell. And with the giant's own sword, David cut the head off that enemy. And I would imagine that the crowd sat silence, even in disbelief. I, I wasn't there. The, the Bible, it doesn't tell us everything. But you're not going to convince me that they did not sit there stunned and silent at what just happened. Mm -hmm. For 40 days, grown men cowering from the threats of this enemy. David's own oldest brother, Eliab, saying, I know your heart. You better get back to the house. You're, he's already mad because the, the prophet said that he was going to be the king and not Eliab. So he's just full of jealousy and envy. You know, you know that even brothers and sisters in the Lord, sometimes if they ain't right with the Lord, they don't even want you to make it. They don't want to see you promoted. They don't want to see you blessed. And listen to me, if you walk around with your chip on your shoulder and the enemy is going to constantly try to be flicking that chip off, trying to mess with you and frustrate you, don't worry about what other people say. And even in the church, worry about what the Lord says. Right. They're over there trying to frustrate David. They were like, no, I don't know about you, but I've been spending some time with the Lord. And I know this ain't God's will. Y'all might want to live in bondage like that dog in that kennel and you can't move. No, no, not this young shepherd boy. I'm about to show you what the Lord will do whenever you trust him and you put faith in him. And he walked down there and he sunk that rock in that giant's forehead. And I'm telling you, it had to have been silent. And then I believe this. I can't prove it. This is my story. Then I believe he picked it up. Because that's what every good warrior does after they cut the head off their enemy. <laughs> they pick it up. This doesn't look anything like a head, but they just pick it up and they show it to the crowd. And then I would imagine it just erupted. Yeah. That, that evil body lies still on the ground and the head of that enemy thrust into the air to show them, no, whatever was tormenting you yesterday is not tormenting you anymore. Hallelujah. Because God had a rock. And he did a suddenly. Cool. Listen to me. God will do a suddenly in your life. But you let him. Yes, he will. Yeah. Yes, he will. Jesus said upon this rock, the rock that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. He built his church on it. And we have to build our lives on it. Now I'm going to ask you to come to the keyboard and prepare to play us a song. Amen. I want you to know that the altars are always open. We're going to ask God to move in our hearts and in our lives. If you need prayer, the altars are open. If not, we're going to worship the Lord. Amen? We're going to worship God because He's worthy. So the main thought of my message is this, that Jesus was the rock that gave Jacob rest. He was a pillow for Jacob that night. Jesus was the ladder that gave access to the presence of God. And Jesus is the living stone. That makes us look like him. The question in closing is found in this. It comes out of Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Y'all ready? Just one more, three, three more verses, and then I'll close. And we're gonna worship God. You ready? Whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man that built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, you can play softly. The rain descended. The floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, because it was founded on a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not, shall be likened to a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall. I don't know about you this morning, but I want to build my house on the rock. I don't want to build my house on shifting sand, things that change. Like Naya said in her message the other night, temporal things that are only temporary and change. I want to build my house on the rock. If you need prayer this morning, 
Come to the altar. If not, let's worship the Lord together. Amen.